Hello, my name is Kim Eagle for ACC.org. Uh, I'm from Ann Arbor, Michigan, and we're covering the clinical trials at the ESC 23 meeting, uh, which is in Amsterdam. Uh, and these are four important trials presented on Saturday, August 26th. I'm just delighted to have several experts in clinical trials with us today to talk about the most important trials at this meeting on this particular day. I'm joined by Pyle Coley from Denver, Colorado, and uh, Gabrielle Stegg from Paris, France. Welcome and thank you for joining today. Um, the, the four trials, I wanted to start, Gabriel, with a study that's really an important one looking at how we manage shock. It's called ECLS shock, uh, an important trial. And could you tell us about it? Yeah, and the topic is important because as we all know, while we've made tremendous progress in the management and outcomes of patients with acute myocardial infarction without shock, the mortality of shock has remained stable over the past decades and very high. So if we're going to improve mortality in acute MI, this is probably the area where we should focus on. And there's been a tremendous interest in the last decade in uh, extra cardiac uh, support, life support, using impeller devices and other types of similar devices to improve blood flow to the heart and coronary vessels. Um, but we haven't had much evidence to base our decision-making on. Now, Dr. Peel from Germany has been one of the leading experts that previously did a landmark trial in the space called IEBP2 that demonstrated that IEBP, intraortic balloon pumping, did not really improve outcomes in these patients and were sort of futile. Now, this same group of investigators in Germany and now Slovenia have conducted another landmark pioneering trial that looked at ECLS in patients with cardiogenic shock and acute myocardial infarction planned for revascularization. They randomized patients to ECLS or no ECLS using VA ECMO, and their primary outcome was all post mortality, very simple, undisputable outcomes. And to make a long story short, there was no difference in mortality according to the treatment. Even more so, there was no improvement in outcomes or secondary outcomes, and there was no improvement in mortality, the primary outcome across the various patient subsets, indicating that really there doesn't seem to be much benefit in implementing ECLS in this group of patients. Finally, what the authors did was a nice meta-analysis of their own trial, which is the largest trial in this space, with all of the existing, uh, pre-existing randomized trials testing the same question. And again, the results are consistent. So I think this is going to definitely change practice. This is very big, and it shows that a negative trial can be as important to change clinical practice as a positive trial. To me, this is very big. Yeah, I agree. The amount of resources it takes to take these types of technologies into the field, and even in the ER, is substantial. And if we don't study the, the outcomes and just assume that there's benefit, we're really uh, we're really not serving humankind at all. So it's an important trial, and I really appreciate that wonderful summary. There's another trial today called Clear Outcomes that's important. Pyle, tell us about that trial. So the Clear Outcomes trial was actually presented earlier this year at ACC 2023. And what was presented at ESC uh, during this conference was two sort of sub-studies or post-studies of the main parent trial. So the first was looking at glycemic control uh, and trying to look at outcomes by glycemic control. And the reason the authors looked at this is because we know that statins you know, can increase risk of new onset diabetes in a dose-dependent fashion. And that's often a concern for many of our patients with hyperlipidemia who are diabetic or pre-diabetic. We worry about their A1C when they're on statins. Now, to remind everybody, the CLEAR Outcomes trial was a trial of patients with ASCVD or high-risk primary prevention who are statin intolerant, randomized to bempedoic acid or placebo, and followed over several years. We know that bempedoic acid works in the same pathway as statins, but it's two steps upstream and it's a prodrug, so slightly different mechanism of action. So the first was the clear outcomes trial by glycemic control. And this really looked to see if there was any differences in LDL lowering of this medication based on whether you're normal glycemic, pre-diabetic or diabetic. And there was no difference across those outcomes. Next, they looked at the MACE outcomes. And as you can imagine, bempedoic acid caused a greater absolute reduction 
in terms of MACE 3 and MACE 4 in the diabetic patients. Now, if we think about that, that's probably because the diabetic patients have a higher endpoint event rate. They're higher risk patients. So the relative reduction was the same, uh, whether you were, you know, normal glycemic, pre-diabetic or diabetic, but the absolute reduction in the diabetic patients was a little bit higher. And importantly, bevidoic acid did not increase new onset diabetes. So it doesn't seem to have that same A1C effect that we see with statins, despite the fact that it's working in the same pathway. So that was the glycemic study. Then Dr. Nissen, Steve Nissen also presented the total event study, which was a study looking at whether or not, not just the first event was reduced, but subsequent events as well. And as you know, in cardiology, we've started doing this a lot now to look at the totality of benefit of a medication, not just that first event, but subsequent events. And we saw both a MACE 3 and a MACE 4 reduction that was slightly more robust than the parent trial, suggesting that recurrent events are also reduced. But the majority of those recurrent events that were reduced were really the coronary revest that was driving a lot of this. So good news that we're not seeing that effect on uh, new onset diabetes with this agent. And good news that in higher risk patients, the benefit is, appears to be higher. And that's that's just uh, you know very important for our practice as we start incorporating this newer agent into our therapies. Um, Gabrielle, tell us about STOPT DAPT3. Yeah, um, STOPT DAPT3 is a trial on the duration and type of antiplatelet therapy post PCI. Another one in this space, and it's been conducted by a group of seasoned Japanese investigators who've already previously published in STOP DAPT and then STOP DAPT2 and then STOP DAPT2 ECS trials. So they're quite experienced in this. And um, as we know, we we have been generally uh, interventions and they have been testing shorter and shorter durations of DAPT. Now here they try to push the envelope farther and say, well, can we do away with aspirin completely and stop aspirin at, on the day of PCI and institute P2A12 inhibitor monotherapy from day zero to day 30 compared to DAPT in the same patient population. Um, what they found, what they expected to find was a reduction in bleeding and what they hoped to find was a maintenance of efficacy and therefore that this would be a safe approach. Now, they didn't find a reduction in bleeding. That was somewhat of a surprise because this was a well-powered trial with 3,000 patients. Um, what they did see is some disturbing signals of reduced efficacy, i.e. increased risk of stent thrombosis and increased risk of coronary revascularization. Now, to be fair, they did satisfy their predefined criteria for non-inferiority, but these were quite generous and probably not clinically very relevant. Now, the authors themselves caution against overinterpreting this, and I think they, they agree that there's a signal here of potential harm by dropping aspirin on the day of PCI. Now, our interpretation of these findings should be colored by one very specific observation, which is that the, the antiplatelet therapy that was used for monotherapy was low-dose prasugrel using what is approved in Japan as the regimen for Prasugrel, a 20 milligram loading dose and a 3.75 milligram daily dose, which is much lower than what is usually uh, used in other parts of the world. And maybe that was insufficient to protect patients against ischemic events. The other observation is that there was no reduction in bleeding. That may be surprising, but maybe what counts for bleeding, particularly for early events that are largely paraprocedural, are more the chronic antiplatelet therapy that patients receive and the paraprocedural anticoagulation that they receive at the time of ACS, as opposed to the chronic antiplatelet therapy that they receive after ACS. So I think this is really a reminder that we should be cautious and not assume that we can indefinitely shorten and reduce the intensity and duration of antiplatelet therapy post-PCI. Maybe we shouldn't push the envelope too far. Yeah, I think you're right that we're probably not willing, we're not ready to abandon aspirin entirely. Uh, and it's a very useful perspective on how we dose antiplatelet therapies in general and, and the international variability in how that is approached from one country to another. There's another trial being presented today called FIRE. I love yeah. the name. Tell us about that one, Gabrielle. That's another interesting trial because it's looking at a very um, a, a question that's already been studied pretty extensively, which is 
how should we address multivessel disease in patients who have undergone culprit lesion therapy with PCI for ACS? Should we use complete revascularization or should we have only culprit revascularization? Now, the angle that the authors took is twofold. First of all, what they compared was culprit only versus physiology guided FFR revascularization of multivessel disease. But most importantly, what sets this trial apart from other trials is that they focused on elderly patients above 75 years of age. And I think this is really important because this is a very different patient population from what uh, the, po the population that has been studied in previous trials so far. And we know that elderly patients may have a completely different uh, equation for benefit and risk of interventions and anti uh, antithrombotic interventions. So it's very conceivable that this population has a different result. And what they found is actually they found a dramatic benefit of um, physiology-guided, FFR-guided complete revascularization of ACS patients with multivessel disease compared to culprit alone in this elderly patient population with a reduction in their primary outcome composite, but also a reduction in death or MI and even a reduction in depth, cardiovascular mortality. So I think they provide a compelling case for saying we should not deprive elderly patients above 75 years of age from the benefits of complete revascularization in ACS, and we should do this in a guided manner using FSR. Yeah, I think this is a potentially a trial that will change how some people work in their cath labs. Uh, and I applaud the investigators for taking on a high-risk group uh, and finding a way to randomize a large number of them to a very important study design. I, I also thought it was fascinating that there were a lot of non-ST elevation event patients in this group as well, because we have a lot of data, of course, for ST elevation MIs and complete revascularization, but this really pushed that envelope to non-ST elevation patients as well, which we know can happen in, in an older patient population. So the pathophysiology of the diseases, despite being different, seems to respond to complete revascularization in the same way. I agree with you. Um, different physiology, and certainly this approach looks very promising. Well, I want to thank the two of you for excellent insights into the four trials that we talked today. Uh, this is Kim Eagle for ACC.org, and I'm out. Mm -hmm.